Welcome everybody. Um, um, I know already most of you, but uh, some faces are new. And uh, I, so I would like to start off by introducing myself. My name is Maria Hellstrom Raymer, and I'm a professor at, in design theory at Malmö University uh, Department of uh, Arts and Communication. And uh, this lecture is uh, part of a series of lectures here during the fall, uh, um, which is included in the course Design Theory, 30 credits. Um, but today I'm not alone. Um, I also want to welcome Rolf Hughes, who is a colleague of mine from Konstfak, University of, of Arts and Crafts in Stockholm. And design. And design. <coughs> Not to forget. <laughs> and uh, well, um, you all, you were also a um, writer, or what you say, um, novelist yourself, or you 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 have um, been working with uh, or in entering the design field from from that perspective. Uh, we are also colleagues in the committee um, for this artistic research. Um, uh, which is part of the uh, Swedish Research Council. Uh, and Rolf also works in Brussels at the St. Lucas University um, School of Architecture. So you've got a very broad competence really from this field. My own um, background is actually also as an artist, but also um, landscape architecture, uh, a field where taught since 1994 and also a field the field where I did my my own PhD um, which was uh, you can say um, a study on the border between many different disciplines art architecture landscape architecture urbanism and uh, also more theoretical general fields like aesthetics and design philosophy uh, and I guess that's a bit how a way of characterizing design as a field we're really into a very interdisciplinary domain here and you can approach design from many many perspectives which we will try to do today <coughs> although we will also, one, one ambition of, in this uh, um, lecture today is to do so through different examples and in, in that way trying also to concretize this often very blurry discussion. Let's see. Uh, another important um, uh, ambition here is to um, try to uh, uh, give uh, an account of what we consider to be a paradigmatic shift in design from this idea of form or form giving or perhaps the idea of design as a refined form of craft based often on the special focus of the positive shaping of forms giving forms this finalized shape um, into something that is much more processual, you can say, an understanding of design as a practice that transgresses this form, um, at least in this preconceived way, and, and also in that sense offering an alternative understanding of the relationship between, let's say, thought, hand and world. And. Um, I think I'm going to start off here because my three examples are more of a more historical kind. Um, and I also invite you to, to comment or interrupt if you find anything really difficult to understand or, or if you have a, a, a special opinion on, on something here. I guess you, you recognize this. Most of you recognize this. It's uh, the Eames Lounge and Ottoman, designed in 1956 by Charles and Ray Eames, the famous design couple for Herman Miller. And it's a piece 
combination of plywood, leather and aluminium. And it's really an exa example of classic design, I would say. It has this uh, sense of usability. It's something that you can use. It's also comfortable. And have you tried that? If you have tried it, you know it is actually comfortable. It's not only that, it's also a desirable object. It's made out of exclusive materials and it, it's also built on a pioneering technology. It's not only about need then, but also about this production of new needs and the production of, of, uh, of um, some kind of, of value. Um, what, it, what it produces, I think, also is actually the idea of relaxation. When you look at this chair, it's really giving you the sense of, as we, as we conceive of it, the sense of being totally relaxed. And why is that important? Well, of course, in our society, in this industrial or, or, or really tough or, or scheduled society, of course, relaxation would be something desirable in, in itself. So what the Eames couple were so skillful with when they designed this was some kind of timing. They managed to come up with a product that really produced a need that was still not there, but that could be kind of um, that the market answered to. So they combined this idea of timing with, with something that we, we um, uh, call the market, which is not, not about needs, it's something that is about potential needs. Um, and another way of expressing this could be in terms of economy. It was a timing of a product in relation to a certain economy. Um, and the timing was about making all these pieces come together, fall into place or fit together in a specific way. It's not a, new, a unified object as a kind of crafted object would be. Uh, it's, it, it's not really a unified form either. It's the result of a list of specifications, list of requirements, a list perhaps of wishes of how this furniture should work and also a list of available materials and processes. So you could really, rather than calling it an object, you could call it an assemblage. It's an assemblage of functions, materials, technologies, but also of meaning and values. So here we've already moved from form to something that is more of a system, more of an economy. Actually, it's a pretty good illustration of, of uh, how a commercial economy works, uh, of how a product would come into being. It tells the story about, of its own coming into being in, an, in, a, in a certain way. Everything from the uh, leather uh, upholstery the aluminium uh, construction here to the rosewood, <coughs> Brazilian rosewood plywood that was, was used in the original, which is to a certain extent an imperial part of, of this object, something that uh, a Western industrial nation could retrieve without too high a cost at this point. So it's, it's an image of, of commercial economy. It's an image of a circuit of production and con consumption of use. Uh, and in, in that way, it's also not only form, but some kind of time-based object. Uh, it has several, it hints to social meanings. And I think this is also very much shown in this com commercial. So you can see it's 
see here in order to market uh, this product, it's not only about marketing its form, it's also about this process of the assemblage as such coming together, the, the swift construction and how all the parts really fit into this whole complex. And then in the end also of course the use. That was probably the wife passing by, and then here we have seen also the other associations coming to, to life as you kind of lean back <coughs> and uh, relax. <coughs> so it's an object. Okay, now it's deconstructed again. I think we can skip that less how to do that. Um, not only a, an object, but the object is actu actually also an actor in a situation here where meaning is produced. Uh, so the design of the, of the Eames couple is... När man då köpte den här stolen var det meningen att man skulle gå igenom den här processen själv, som i IKEA, att man Eller, eller visar de bara på hur stolen ser ut i typ genomskärning? Mm. Alltså så här funkar den. I am saying yeah. English. Um, very good question. No, uh, IKEA is the next step. Mm. <laughs> so this was basically only a commercial. Uh, the, the target group for this chair, which costs approximately now, in, in, in Europe at least, 9,000 uh, US dollars or, or equivalent to euros. The target group does not want to assemble this piece themselves. They want to buy it as it is. But it's possible. But it seems like it was for men. It's like, oh, it's very interesting how it's built. <laughs> Definitely. And, yeah. Man was... It was he, he was like uh, working and his yes. wife was at home and he was so going home. <laughs> I think your, your comment is... Very interesting because it's definitely a gendered object and a gendered process in a way, and the target group and the, the man is is the one with the money. So yeah, he and paying. he and he was probably very uh, attracted by this commercial. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah, it's more geared towards a person that would also buy a car or something. Yeah. You know, the same kind of language. Definitely. But it's interesting, it <coughs> puts him in the context of work and leisure. The, the advert wouldn't work if it just showed him relaxing. First of all, he works, and then he gets to the ward of relaxing. It's, as you said at yeah. the beginning, it's, mm -hmm. uh, relaxation is put in the context of the demands of industrial society. Mm. So. Yeah. so, again, I think what the Eames were really good at was this timing, this mastering of... Uh, a kind of um, zeitgeist, a kind of a spirit of the time uh, where these things were really important. And so not surprisingly they actually turned away from designing objects and um, uh, put the, their energy into designing whole environments. Um, they, were, they were engaged by big companies like the IBM for uh, designing their um, uh, environments for, for exhibitions and world affairs. And uh, these environments are, were, of course, communicative environments, environments that would uh, communicate values and ideas. And one very famous um, exhibition design they did was uh, for um, the Moscow World Fair in 1959. Uh, this was right in the middle of the Cold War. And the US and the, uh, uh, the Soviet Union had come to an agreement of cultural, scientific and technological exchange. So this World Fair was set up. Um, so this is designed on a highly geopolitical level. Um, it's multimedia design, it's multi-scale design. Uh, one very famous 
incident from this World Fair is, is known as the Kitchen Debate. And it took place inside the exhibition in a house that was set up as a kind of model of the American way of living. That was what was supposed to be communicated to the Soviet public, that the American way of living was actually um, much, much better, um, superior it, as in comparison with the, the Soviet way of living. So design was here used as an actual weapon in the Cold War. Uh, the kitchen debate was a debate in a, a kitchen uh, setting between uh, the Vice President Richard Nixon and the leader of the Soviet Union, uh, Nikita Khrushchev. And the, their debate was not about arms, not about territories, not about uh, space programs. It was about washing machines, about TV sets about um, uh, electric uh, appliances in kitchens, uh, which was fascinating. And um, the centerpiece of this exhibition was also this multi-screen installation by the Eames uh, called Glimpses of the USA. That thousands and thousands of uh, uh, Russians uh, watched during this exhibition. Um, they were not delivering facts, scientific uh, uh, hard facts, but they were de de delivering persuasive, emotional glimpses, tasty, enticing, and deliberately playing on feelings, of course, on emotions, on values, and so on and so forth. So design is here played out really on very many levels from the kitchen up to this geopolitical uh, level. And they continue to work uh, on this, uh, in this way. In 1977, they did another film that is really showing how design, in, in their way of dealing with it, really changed, had the power of changing people's way of, of experiencing the universe, of, of experiencing the world. That was their aim, not only to solve minor everyday problems, that was important too, but to affect the way people um, conceived of, 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 their, uh, rea of the rea reality. And I think this film, which is perhaps their most famous, is, is very interesting in that sense. side in Chicago was the start of a lazy afternoon, early one October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every ten seconds we will look from ten times farther away, and our field of view will be ten times wider. This square is ten meters wide, and in ten seconds the next square will be ten times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. One hundred meters wide. The distance a man can run in 10 seconds. Cars crowd the highway. Power boats lie at their docks. The colorful bleachers are soldiers' field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10 seconds. We see first the rounded end of Lake Michigan, then the whole great lake. 10 to the fifth meters. The distance an orbiting satellite covers in 10 seconds. Long parades of clouds. The day's weather in the Middle West. 10 to the sixth, a one with six zeros, a million meters. Soon the Earth will show as a solid sphere. We are able to see the whole Earth now, just over a minute along the journey. And then, of course, we have to turn around. Seven. Six, five, four, three, two, one. We are back at our starting point. We slow up at one meter, ten to the zero power. 
Now we reduce the distance to our final destination by 90% every 10 seconds, each step much smaller than the one before. At 10 to the minus 2, one one hundredth of a meter, one centimeter, we approach the surface of the hand. In a few seconds, we'll be entering the skin, crossing layer after layer from the outermost dead cells into a tiny blood vessel within. Skin layers vanish in turn, an outer layer of cells, felty collagen. The capillary containing red blood cells and a roughly lymphocyte we enter the white cell. Among its vital organelles, the porous wall of the cell nucleus appears. The nucleus within holds the heredity of the man in the coiled coils of DNA. As we close in, we come to the double helix itself, a molecule like a long twisted ladder whose rungs of paired bases spell out twice in an alphabet of four letters, the words of the powerful genetic message. At the atomic scale, the interplay of form and motion becomes more visible. We focus on one commonplace group of three hydrogen atoms bonded by electrical forces to a carbon atom. Four electrons make up the outer shell of the carbon itself. They appear in quantum motion as a swarm of shimmering points. At 10 to the minus 10 meters, one angstrom, we find ourselves right among those outer electrons. Yeah, and, and this um, promotion video is, is uh, in much longer you get further out into outer space before you turn around and we'll get even further inside this microcosmos as well and the message here is obviously that uh, this is the design universe it's limited only by our own imagination and our own um, uh, capabilities of visualizing and communicating this, um, which is really extremely fascinating. Um, I think I'll leave this now and uh, turn to my second example. I think I will only have time for two, <laughs> unfortunately, we'll see. Um, but um, in case we have more time, we can take the third in the end. Um, the second example, which I find also very um, Ill Ill illustrative of this shift that we are talking about is actually appearing more or less at the same time as uh, the film uh, by the Eames, The Powers of Ten. It's about mastering, it's, it's, um, it's an example of this mastering of media space um, that the Eames so eloquently dealt with but in, in a slightly different way um, I don't know. I mean, you, you're probably, many of you, you're not the generation who would immediately recognize this item. Somebody here that does not know what it is. No, I know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, most of you do. Uh, it's, it's an object that is already obsolete, uh, the Sony Walkman. Um, but actually, it died, it passed away only last October. Uh, then uh, there were, were these obituaries appearing in many uh, new, uh, magazines in all over the world. Uh, of the th of the thirty years of um, of uh, doing its duty, service thirty years of service, it actually was considered obsolete and taken out of production. Uh, it's a simple, modest, ordinary thing. It's got nothing of the lounge and Ottoman uh, uh, identity over it, but yet it represents this significant shift. Um, let's see where I am. My notes. Um, yeah. It, it, to some extent, you can say that it concentrates these communicative experiences that the, the Eames couple were dealing with in their films uh, in one single design object that you can consider a cultural artifact. In the text that you are reading, Paul Duguay talks about this 
fact that certain objects become cultural in a specific way. And the idea here is very simple. It's a, it's a device that enables you to private listening in public space. But precisely that is very revolutionary here. It embodies many of, of the ideas we have of being modern, being contemporary. Um, it embodies in a very special way this feeling of being an individual in a crowd, of not being part of the crowd, but being also an individual. It also embodies this idea of media use as remedy or relaxation, that you use media in order to, to um, self-medicate, you can say, um, to escape problems in society. It, also um, embodies this <coughs> idea of mo mobility as freedom, which is very important to us. And, last but not least important, this idea of flexible identity. Of identity, but also an identity that is flexible, that you can change. So, um, all these aspects are also very clearly, uh, I, I would say, dealt with in this commercial, if I can, yeah, there it is, from 1979, in the childhood of uh, uh, video commercials, that, personalize your move through the city uh, and having your own soundtrack mm -hmm. to your life is really something that we take for granted now perhaps but that was actually extremely revolutionary at the time um, and um, uh, well, I think also the amateurish kind of style of this video is really before it's really avant-garde in the sense that it was kind of new language, a new way of expressing things, a new way of doing commercials, a new way of communicating this content. And it's also changing between a first person perspective and a third person perspective. So we are also able to both follow this guy as he walks through the city from his own perspective and seeing him. Uh, feeling the envy uh, that is kind of produced here in, in, in this video. Um, yeah, um, I think it's, it's a very good example of this idea of a cultural artifact producing social meaning, producing not only a form that you may admire, but also a situation around it which is really the important thing here. It's not really designed as a result of a, of a general structure or means of production, let's say a structure as in a feudal society, in a rural society, in, a, in, in an industrial society, 
but it also it's also an example of the fact that design operates as articulations of this overall structure as specific articulations on an everyday level and as articulations they are also able to change the system uh, the design we have already been talking about that is not a finalized product it can actually give feedback to the system and also change uh, the overall um, conditions of the environment. And it does so very often through use, uses that are not uh, embedded in the product uh, from the point of view of the designer, but that enters the product through the actual use. So, what the Sony Walkman really did was it combined this idea of mass production with uh, the personal differentiation. Um, it came in many different colors and styles, and so you could really have your own, plus the crucial personalization of the music, of course, that you put in that you would put into it. In that sense, you can say that this is really uh, an example of design in the age of an early example, I would, I would say, of design in the age of electronic reproduction. And then I'm, of course, referring to a very famous text by a philosopher named Walter Benjamin, who wrote about art in the age of mechanical reproduction. We could also talk about design in the age of mechanical reproduction, where historically design has been this form, uh, this reproduced form, the reproduction of an original, unique artwork, uh, which enabled this item, the, the artwork, to be distributed to a larger public, a larger audience. Um, uh, and this reproduction in the, in the age of mechanical reproduction was also partly a problem because it destroyed the aura of the artwork. It destroyed this unique, this original value. And, uh, it um, lowered the value, so to speak. It, it, it uh, destroyed the authenticity of this original piece. The, the Walkman does something completely different. In the age of electronic reproduction, it's not really a question of reproducing an ideal. We turn from reproduction into seriality, which is really completely different. There is no original anymore. There is no ideal, but a series of unique varieties. All of them are unique. Unique articulations, uh, unique situations, and also unique personal memories, because many of, of us belonging to this generation of the Sony Walkman have extremely personal, very emotional memories of using this commercial cultural artifact. So that is really a very significant shift, I would say. Um, and if the first shift was really from object into mass mediation and communication through the object, um, here we have yet another step that takes us into a social situation that we ourselves can also affect. And I think I'll stop there and let you continue and then we'll see if we have more time in the end because I don't want to take up too much time. We also need time for discussion. So please, Rolf. Sure? Yeah. Very good. Are you happy?